Hello and welcome to another reunion episode of Technology in the Arts. My name is Brian Kelly. And I'm John Lamezny. We may have said during our December reunion show that we wouldn't do another one of these for a while, but WordPress, our favorite, is turning 20 years old on May 27th. And we've been proud WordPress users for a large portion of that time. But first, uh, we need to do some serious catching up. John, it's very good to see you again. How are you doing? It's good to see you too, Brian. Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. How are you doing? <laughs> I, I, I'm doing great now, uh, but as I will go into in depth later and not written by uh, AI uh, at all, uh, I will be talking about a near-death experience I had earlier this month. It's but, funny you sound so chipper about it. <laughs> I am now, especially since I'm, I'm, I'm having to do research as to what happened because it it was a rare thing, but it's a long story. I'll tell it later. It John tried to shorten it with AI, but <laughs> we'll I successfully see, shortened we'll it. We'll see how AI. that went. Um, but I'm doing okay now. Uh, I'll tell that story in a little bit. But first, John, what have you been up to? Well, uh, I've been reconnecting with my family. I've been uh, in Charlottesville for about seven years, I want to say since 2015 you can do the math so seven years and uh i haven't really talked to my family very much maybe once or twice by phone or by chat and uh, my sister contacted me uh my youngest sister uh, the next in line i'm the baby she's about 10 years older and she contacted me and said uh hey i'd like to get together and just catch up and I was like, oh, that's great. You know, so we worked out this plan and I was able to like write out an itinerary of things that she could do while she was here. And she came and it was great. She got to see my son graduate from uh, Gov School in Virginia. And uh, I've connected with another sister just sort of chatting. So it's been a time of reconnection, which is really great. And Thanksgiving, my really the only holiday that I like to celebrate I'm probably going to spend with my sister, which feels really good, and my sons. Uh, one other thing that I thought was incredibly interesting was, uh, you may know from past episodes that I have a uh, certain kind of love for Reddit. And uh, recently, one thing that I came across that I thought was fascinating was this uh, list that somebody published from research that they did that said it's a list of essentially every project, task, goal, note, idea, or piece of information can be categorized into one of the following 15 categories. Would you like to, to know what that what the list of categories is, Brian? Hit me, John. So I know you like one, to, but uh, I'm, I'm at a safe distance here. Yeah, the computers are just not up to uh, up to those standards yet. So the first one is career meaning academics, jobs, entrepreneurship, et cetera. The second one is finances, things like budget, savings, et cetera. Third is home. Fourth is transportation. The next one is tech. Next one is fitness. Next one is grooming. The next one is sexual. The next one is health. The next one is mental. The next one is social. The next one is spiritual. The next one is productivity. Then projects, then fun. And I thought it was a really interesting list because I'm forever categorizing things. I have a categorical uh, mind and I like to have things organized. I thought this was a really nice, concise list of uh, categories that you could put things into. If you're working in a calendar, working in something like Keep as a note taking application, I just thought it was great as ways to tag things that are important, things related to career tech. Uh, health, social, et cetera. So I just thought that I would bring that up because I think that uh, categorization is kind of an art. Um, but speaking of Reddit, one of the things that I find very frustrating about Reddit comparative to, let's say, Facebook, I feel like Facebook, uh, you, cert you get a certain kind of a groove and you, you understand what your audience wants and sometimes you even get feedback to that effect. But on Reddit, it's so different. The, the focus is not the, that the story is yours, but the, that it's a story. And so on Facebook, people have context of who you are in order to be interested in your post about your son or whatever it is. And uh, Reddit's not like that. I haven't quite uh, cracked the code on 
on what to do in order to have uh, a popular post. And as somebody who is interested in social media, both of us are interested in social media as a, as a topic, I wondered what your feelings were about posts that you make and you think are going to do well and then there's a lack of social response for it. In other words, people ignore what you have to say. You and I have both experienced that. I wonder what your feelings were about it. You know, people were ignoring what I had to say a long time before social media, so I'm used to that. It right. doesn't really bother me. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it is odd, though, that sometimes I think of something should get you know likes or retweeted or shared and you know, it doesn't really get anywhere but then something stupid like some you know some meme or a, a gif you know a gif whatever it's, it's a things. gif yeah i know it's the it should be a gif but it's a graphical yes i yeah but um i uh you know those you know those get shared for some reason or liked it's just so it doesn't really bother me, but uh, I mean, for a time, I was just posting to myself on Facebook at one point. <laughs> I mean, when I uh, nuked my old account and, and set up my account just to, you know, I basically used it as a rant room for me. So even though I was kind of just shouting into the air, it was just good to write some thoughts down and uh, put them out there. I think maybe Allison and maybe you were the only ones actually reading them. At one point. Yeah, and I'm on I'm on Facebook so infrequently now. I mean, if I come in, I'll uh, the algorithm algorithm will usually present your post to me, amongst with a few other people. And if I see something that is uh, interesting, like your recent near death experience, I certainly uh, will give it a like or a hug or whatever. I, I don't know why I find it funny. I, I mean, it was serious. It was a serious situation. I just don't know why I find it funny. It's, I think it's better to be able to find some humor in it than, than to focus on, you know, the, the um, gravity of it. But one thing about Reddit that I find really interesting is um, the karma system. And uh, it, it works like it sounds. Essentially, as a post goes up, just like uh, Dig used to do, you can thumbs up it or you can thumbs down it. And as people do that, and anybody can see it, for the most part, um, you get more or less karma. And you can get karma on a post. You can get karma in a comment. You can get karma from uh, uh, being recognized or given an award. And um, I have a relatively low karma of about 2.7 thousand uh, karma points. And... Uh, what's strange is like a lot of a, a large percentage of that number came from a single post where I knew somebody personally who was very popular on Reddit and they had a post. They, they're in the tens of thousands of, of karma points. And I liked something that they said and I responded to them and asked them about their family. And a whole bunch of people like that because most of those people who love that person don't know him. And so I got all this uh, sort of um, peripheral karma. So it's a very strange system. And uh, I guess I was just wondering, you know, what you thought about it. But how about you, Brian? I've heard I've heard that you've been in the hospital lately. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, I'll get to that in, in, in a second. Uh, I just realized, though, that the, my curtain behind me has a seam like right over my head. It looks like I have a shark fin or something on my head. I was thinking uh, more you were getting pulled into an ass. Like, I, I, ass I, I, I feel like Yondu from Guardians of the Galaxy. You I look like Yondu. Like I, I feel like I should be able to whistle and control a, a space arrow or something. But anyway, uh, yeah, so well, before before I, I went into the hospital uh, unexpectedly, uh, I just want to update that uh, I did release my album in March, my full-length debut. It's self-released. It's it's terribly produced and mixed. Um, it sounds better than my EP, but it's, you know, I thankfully my friend Christian Beach has uh, offered to uh, remix some things, but my whole hospitalization episode is kind of uh, cast that aside for a little bit. But um, you can stream or download it at ferociousdesigns.com, and it's also what ferociousdesigns.bandcamp.com. 
running WordPress. It is. It is my my website uh, for for Ferocious Designs, my personal blog. Yeah, it's all on WordPress. I guess we should keep iterating that we are here to celebrate WordPress, and we will get to that. <laughs> Right. Wherever we can fit it in, we'll just say yes, that. yes, yeah. we'll squeeze it in at the end. It might be cut for time, it, possibly. <laughs> All right. So anyway, uh, May 9th, um, and the weekend before this—that so was a Tuesday. The weekend before was suffering from the worst toothache. Um, it was it was a tooth that I had a root canal on uh, done on in uh, 2019. It never took. I have problematic gums. Family history of bad teeth. So it's a big issue for me um in pain all weekend couldn't sleep it was just excruciating monday uh on the 8th i go to the dentist uh to take an x-ray like yeah we have to we have to extract that because that's that's way too infected so i make an appointment for the next day tuesday may 9th they give me a 3 p.m slot which i can't make because my kids are coming home from school and also uh, you know, it's late in the day and I, I you know, I, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I want to get done as soon as possible. So the person at the desk says, you know, just come in at nine and, and we'll squeeze you in. So they did. They squeezed me in. Um, and I thought that might have been a factor in this because I thought maybe things got rushed. But anyway, uh, I'm so sure they, they give me a couple shots. I don't get numb. They give me a few more shots, which I thought was weird. And then they like pulled the tooth. Like it all happened very quickly. There was no waiting or whatever. And so, but the tooth comes out. Everything's fine. I have a mouth full of gauze. I'm bleeding, but fine. I'm no more pain. The infection's been scraped out. I go up, I pay, I leave. I go to Walgreens. I drop off my prescription for painkillers. And I go to Aldi for some soft food doing jazz hands with my death story um so um yeah so i go to aldi and <laughs> i go to aldi i walk in i'm fine and then like by the time i get to the checkout my entire body is shaking i have ridiculous severe chills and i'm like this is this is bad this is i don't know what it is but this is bad somehow I managed to get back to the car i call allison i'm like I don't know if I'm going into shock or something, but I, I need to get to the hospital. And she's like, Oh, just wait for me. You know, I'm 20 minutes away. And I'm like, I, I can't wait. This is, this is bad. This is really bad. And I, I said, I love you. Um, called 911. Ambulance comes. I don't remember much about it, but I get to the hospital and my temperature is spiked to 105.5, which is crazy. Um, you know, they strip me down. They put ice packs all over me. I hear the term malignant hyperthermia. Um, I, I hear the word dantrolene. Uh, turns out that's a reversal agent, which was only discovered accidentally in like the 80s before before they stumbled onto that. Um, malignant hyperthermia was like at an 80 percent mortality rate. And now it's about and now it's down to like 5 percent. But so thanks, dantrolene. But um so they, they inject me with that. I'm getting all these fluids. Uh, temperature, you know, just took a long time to come down. Allison finally made it there. Um, you know, they, they talked to me, you know, I was going to have to stay overnight. There was one doctor who apparently was not convinced it was malignant hyperthermia because it's a rare thing. It's it, 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 it hardly anybody gets this, especially from local anesthetic. The medical community basically decided a few years ago that local anesthetics are fine but some reason it wasn't for me and um uh, he he tried to say it was a bacterial infection but it turned out that wasn't the case um but they're like okay we're gonna send you to the step down icu which is called telemetry we're gonna monitor you overnight if, if your fever is gone by the morning you know you should be on your way so it's like 8 a.m i have no fever it's like around 98 something or whatever and Doctor says, yeah, I'll go work up the, you know, discharge papers. I'm like, well, what do you think? Like hour, two or whatever. It's like, no, no, like half hour. So I'm like, okay. So I call Allison. She's just gotten to work. I'm like, you have to come get me. So she does, she gets there. And as she's there, they take my temperature and it's going up to 100 again. I'm like, ah, man. And then they took another temperature. They expedited it. And it, um, it was at 
So now I'm not going home. And they order another blood culture to see if it's an infection. And uh, for some reason, the other one took a few hours. And now they tell me like later that day that it's going to take 48 hours to get the second one. So I'm stuck there for whatever. It's just crazy. You know, I was like minutes away from getting out, literally, and had to wind up staying not just overnight, but for two more nights. So got there on a Tuesday afternoon, left like around mid morning on uh, Friday. Uh, so that would have been the 10th, 11th, the 12th, I guess. Um, so, yeah, it was it was scary. It, there were some scary moments and, uh, you know, the body's not supposed to body doesn't really react to spikes up to one Oh five, five in a matter of minutes. So, uh, you know, and like I said, it, it used to be fairly fatal <laughs> back in the day. Um, you know, when I was, when I was born, it, it, it was, it was rather a lethal condition. So, uh, so going to affect anything like your running ability or, well, yeah, I mean, well, first of all, they pumped so much liquid into me, uh, so many fluids. I, I gained like 22 pounds in the hospital, which was awful. Uh, my feet and legs were numb and swollen. And I thought uh, if, like the first night I was out, I, I read about a side effect called compartment syndrome, which it sounded very similar to that. And it's a permanent thing. And you need some pretty major surgery to even you know try to relieve it. And uh, I was like, oh, I, I cannot deal with that. I mean, in like extreme cases, you could lose your feet or, you know, you lose, you know, you know, extremities. And like, that was, that was just not <laughs> sitting well with me, but I seem to be fine now. I just, um, but now that it's triggered and so it's, I might be a case study because everything about what happened to me is rare. It was rare to get it from a local anesthetic. It was rare that the, the, the Condition itself is rare. You, you only are supposed to get it if you have a um, a gene mutation. So I am I'm a mutant. My X Men name is Death Rattle because I was shaking and I was close to death. So Death Rattle is my X Men name. I decided. Um, so they. Yeah. So they're, and then they're telling me like, um, you're, it sh you should have happened like in the chair. <laughs> it should have happened when they gave me, uh, whatever they gave me. And I, I found out it was the first two shots were standard 2% lidocaine. And then those uh, additional shots were septicaine. But the following week I talked to my dental surgeon and wanted to see like what exactly they used on me, what has been used on me in the past, and everything had been used on me previously. And now I never had a problem with this. And um, you know, and, and like I said, it happened like 40 minutes later, so it didn't happen in the chair. The, the surgeon even said that to me. He's like, he's like, I'm surprised you even walked out of here, and uh, with that, because I've never heard of anybody getting that from a local anesthetic. And um. Do you have yeah. to take statins by any chance? I, I do, and that's what I just found out. So in the fall, I was I was prescribed a statin, and I have been prescribed statins in the past because my cholesterol elevates every now and then, especially in periods when I'm not running and kind of not doing anything. <laughs> but um, um, so I'm on a statin, and I found a paper uh, earlier today that let's bring it up. You have it. Oh, uh, I have it no. on my phone, but no, I don't have it no. set up on my, um, I'm joking, Brian. I, 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 but yes. Yeah, so there's a paper from 2020, um, that statins can unmask a latent, uh, uh, disposition for something like malignant hyperthermia. So the, I may have the mutated gene, but it was, it was hidden. It was, it wasn't active. But the statin may have activated it. And I had, you know, I was exposed to anesthetic during that time. And now that it's triggered, I, I don't know if if I can bottle it up again. I, I think now that it's triggered, it's out there. And now I have to deal with it. I have to figure out what exactly triggered it. 
you know, because I, I, my mouth is a mess. I need more dental work and, and I have to figure out, you know, what what I can do for, uh, you know, for numbing that in, in, for future procedures. So it, it's crazy. I, so I have to get genetic testing. I have to find out like what the deal is with this mutation. Um, and, and so do my boys, my, you know, Graham and Ben will have to get it, you know, which is not great for Ben. Yeah. Ben is nonverbal, uh, has, has autism. So, uh, you know, it's, he doesn't know what's going on. It's so it's, it's, it's kind of scary for him. I, I so it's just a, you know, we may all have to wear, you know, medical alert bracelets about everything, but. But so it's, it seems like you're on the way back to recovery. Is there anything you're looking forward to doing? Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping I can still, uh, that's another thing that can trigger, uh, is, uh, exercising in, ex- in excessive heat. Uh, I'm, I was planning on doing the, my fifth Philly marathon in November and going into the summer months, I need to be running. I don't know uh, what, what I can do. Um, to you know try to prevent that like it, it can just happen you know i i can't there's no warning sign like i said it just started um you know so i have to find out about that um uh, but if i stay away from any anesthetics um any an- local anesthesia uh I, I, hopefully i'll be able to see the 60th anniversary of doctor who later this year and shooty got was uh, first season as the doctor next year and and i got peter gabriel concert coming up in september and uh the new album so been looking forward to that for decades so just happy to be here and of course my family my wife allison who is equally cranky tonight so it's <laughs> Because we didn't get much sleep last night. Well, bring her on. Let's have a conversation about it. Oh, well, that's who was calling me before. So, uh, Well, next time, put the bottom of your phone up to the mic. We can have a three-way. I think she forgot about this, that I was doing it. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I see my the story that I had written out. Uh, John went ahead and used uh, chat, G- chat GPT to uh, rewrite it. Actually, I'll give you one better. I started uh, transcribing your current speech Mm -hmm. and put it into ChatGPT, and I can read you what it gave as a synopsis of what you said. Oh, no. I don't want to hear it. (laughs) Are you sure? It's very short. Uh, What what, what are you talking about? So you said, in March, I released my debate. debut album called Looking for the Light as Ferocious Designs. Unfortunately, I recently had a life-threatening condition called malignant hyperthermia, which is usually triggered by general anesthesia. However, my case was rare as it was triggered by local anesthetics. After having a truth extracted, I suddenly experienced severe chills and shaking while shopping. Realizing it was an emergency, I called 911 and was rushed to the hospital. My temperature spiked to 105.5 Fahrenheit, but thanks to a medication called dantrolene, my condition stabilized. I stayed in the hospital for further tests and treatment, and after 72 hours, I was discharged. I'm now researching MH and undergoing genetic testing. Unfortunately, the condition may limit my physical activities impacting my running plans. Nevertheless, I'm grateful to be alive and look forward to enjoying upcoming events like the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who and a Peter Gabriel concert, along with uh, cherishing time with my family. I thought it did a pretty great job of interpreting what you said and condensing it into a, an executive summary. Brevity is overrated. That's what they say, but usually <laughs> those people are very verbose. I happen to be very verbose. I'm, I'm actually really excited about that feature that AI can take, uh, ChatGPT in particular, can take my 10-page document and make it a one-page summary, you know, and uh, I've started to use it in that way. I think that a lot of the concern and upset about AI is warranted, right? There's a lot of uh, concern around um, uh, uh, intellectual property uh, being used as a source for this without citation. And if you use a uh, chat GPT as part of Bing chat, it does actually give you citations when you look something up, which I think is very encouraging. I hope to see more of that. 
in ChatGPT, or at least a, a maybe a hidden accordion that you can open up in order to find out what the sources were. Uh, but I think that the key to to humans surviving this is to, and I'm I'm not a doomsayer as far as AI is concerned. I think we're far away off from uh, AI being able to uh, launch missiles or anything. There are so many things. So many things are ready to kill us right now before AI. Right. Right, we're trying to kill ourselves. It's it, AI is not going to catch it first. So uh, I think there are dangers. I think that um, if you're an intellectual property holder, your your time is is ticking. I think that uh, there will be engines that make use of copyrighted materials without the consent of the owner. And personally, I I as somebody who really believes in Creative Commons, I'm okay with that. I do have some copyrighted content that I get a small uh, return on for um, in the form of um, royalties, but it's so small. But this is the concern with the writing strike right now, right? People are mm-hmm. expecting to be replaced for a sitcom, especially if it's following a um, if it follows a theme every week that is similar week to week. It will be very easy for ChatGPT to easily write a script that is in the right format and uh, uses all the characters and blah, 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 especially if something is published. So if I told ChatGPT, you know, read these three scripts and then write me a script in a similar fashion that deals with the same category, uh, characters and situations, but this happens, right? This is the main concern. And it's going to come up with something. Did did you see what happened with uh, Max? The the relaunched HBO Max service. It's just now Max. I know that they relaunched it, but that's all I know. Uh, okay, so the whole cavalier attitude toward content and how it's created kind of reared its head because on the the show menus, like when you like the about the show things, you know, the, 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 those screens, it just says creators. And like the director, the writer, the producer, it's all like they just put names in a box. Yeah. Like they didn't specify. I mean, totally against the union rules of of like all the directors guild, whatever the writers guild. You know, everybody you know is 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 mad now, and they're trying to say, oh, it was just an oversight from the the transition. And people are like, that doesn't make any sense because everybody, you know why was everything like jumbled like nothing it shouldn't have been jumbled like that all into one box but yeah they they, they they're, they're preparing to just get rid of everybody and just have ai so, do it it's a money saver i mean the, the thing that they're arguing for is money and and protection uh and rights and royalties but um i just don't i don't know how that's all going to work out i do know that you know this is not the first time that um that a new technology that was uh breaking rules was seen as the death of another uh method of doing that like photography and painting right when photography appeared and was available to many people a lot of people probably said you know why do we need painting anymore and if, of course if you look at painting today and i, I love to paint uh, the the work is evolved uh, because of that. And it's one of the ways that abstraction really showed up because it wasn't as easy to do abstraction on a camera as it was to do on a canvas. So I think it just alters the way that we begin to think about things. And in the same way that it's very common for us to go to Google in order to find an answer, we'll just be using these AI engines instead because it's a it's less interpretive on the uh, on the searcher's part. It's more or less, uh, did you include all the details in your prompt? Did you Was there information that you wanted to include in your prompt? And people are already being paid in order to generate prompts that uh, do the things that people want, you know, like generate reports or write scripts or any of those things. Um, and there's a lot of competition, but it all seems to focus on open AI. Bard uh, from Google, I think, was almost an afterthought. It was like they realized that how important this was to people and started to develop and publish things that were not really ready for publication. Um, and, of course, I work at a university. We've both worked at universities. And 
there's a real fear around even staffers having access to AI, even though we have access outside of the system because of the protective nature of content that belongs to a university and the work that we do. Um, if it becomes available, if that work becomes available to others to use and reveals information that we don't want revealed, it can be very dangerous and it's just untested. We haven't heard any big headlines about, you know, this is the first thing, first step towards tyranny uh, with AI or any of that. We, but UVA doesn't want to be part of that headline. You know what I mean? Uh, one thing that's not available by AI is uh, fireballs in the sky. And last night after we got off of our test run, I went out for a walk. That was one of the reasons I wanted to end at 1030. And tonight I'd like to end at 1032 for the same reason. I went out and I looked at the moon. I intended to go up and check out the moon. It was a crescent moon. Uh, I guess it is waxing. And it was just about to... Uh, moonset last night at midnight. And so the sooner that you're able to get out ahead of moonset, the more chance of seeing one of those really heavy, beautiful moons. And I saw it last night and it was golden and it was yellow and it was white and it was, it, it had uh, clouds around it that were slightly orange and translucent. It was beautiful. So anyway, I'm walking home and as I'm walking home, just to, as I'm about to turn to where my house is, I look up in the sky and an arc appears. It looks like a meteor. And I've seen meteors here before, but usually it's like a ooh, and that's it, right? It's over in less than a second. But this was a set, steady stream of something falling through the atmosphere that lasted for at least seven seconds, maybe 10 seconds. Seven seconds is a long time to see something so huge in the sky, bigger than the moon by uh, multiples. So it was fascinating to watch and i was so moved by it that i went home and i put a post on next door and i put a post on reddit both in the charlottesville area to see if anybody else had experienced it and uh some people did and they responded to me and they made me aware of this really cool site that allows you to submit reports of meteor sightings and in this case because of the length of it uh, it's actually called a fireball. And if if multiple people report it at the same time, uh, it means that it's likely an event, what they call an event. It actually happened. So I was made aware of this on Reddit. I went to the site, submitted my report, and found out that like six other people had seen the same thing and reported it in the same way. They actually said it was much longer, uh, viewer, viewable for a much longer time in the sky. And I said seven, to five, seven and a half seconds or 10 seconds. That Some people said 20 seconds. It felt so long. Uh, so I'm waiting to see whether or not it, or it becomes an event and find out maybe what it was. It seemed like it was coming out of the north, northeast sky. And I don't actually know what uh, constellation was in that part of the sky or else I'd be able to possibly identify it as part of the meteor shower. But I don't think it was that because it was this long, steady stream. It almost looked like, uh, you know how at Yosemite, they uh, set a fire and they drop over a cliff. Mm -hmm. um, it felt like that, except it was on an arc. It was on a, on a, uh, on a, a segment of an, of an arc, a segment of a circle that was uh, where it was coming down. It almost looked like Saturn's rings coming through the atmosphere. It was so beautiful. But it was also beautiful to be able to learn about this uh, tool because every once in a while I'll see a meteor in the sky and usually it's just for me. It's like, hey, I saw this thing. But it would be really cool to be able to report it and see if other people saw it too. I have just missed fireballs like twice in my life. Like oh, yeah. there was one night where I was looking out my back window and I, I was looking at the sky and I'm like, oh, this would be like a perfect night for a fireball. And, you know, then I went and you know, it was time to put the kids to bed. And like I come downstairs, I look at Twitter and it's all like fireball scene in New Jersey. And I'm like, based on like where it was, like where I was looking <laughs> like about 30 minutes later, <laughs> it, was a, it was a fireball. And then one time I was outside and um, I think I was just taking the trash out or something. And 
I, I was looking and I'm like, ah, I look at the, I always look at the sky just to make sure, you know, just in case. And yeah, it was like, again, like two hours later, I was like, oh, there was a fireball. And I just, but did you hear what happened in Hopewell a few weeks ago? No. They, they confirmed it at TCNJ. And I think there was a Rucker scientist. Um, a, a meteor fell through a, a roof at, oh, a, really? at a house in Hopewell. It's now, it's called the uh, Titusville uh, meteor now. Wow. Um, and of course the newspaper is like uh, meteor meteorite falls through Hopewell house. I'm like, no, it wasn't a meteorite until it hit the ground. It's a meteor when it goes to the roof. All right. Ah, meteorite on the ground, on the ground. That really so uh, we, we came together to talk about WordPress and related to that is a topic that you talked a lot about a lot in the last episode. And that is uh, federated content and uh, Automatic's involvement in it, Automatic being the parent company of WordPress. I wondered if you uh, had anything to say about the progress on those fronts. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, I know WordPress uh, announced recently that, you know, auto sharing of uh, posts on, on WordPress blogs uh, to Twitter is is no more, thanks to uh, idiot. Um, but they are adding... Uh, they're in the process of adding auto sharing uh, of posts to Mastodon. So that will be awesome when that is implemented. And I know there's a plugin that does that now, but this is going to be now a standard uh, thing on WordPress. And um, yeah, there's still plans to add activity pub to Tumblr, which would connect it to the Fediverse, not just Mastodon, but all the other um, like pixel fed and, um uh, what are the other ones um Frendisha, which is like facebook pixel fed ob- is like instagram um and there's a few more uh there's something called like a funk whale or something like that which is a like a, a, a uh like a spotify for mm. uh uh the fediverse something like that i can't remember the name of it but um so yeah, so that's still uh, progressing, and uh, and also going on in the Fediverse is that um, Mastodon itself is making it easier to sign up. They're they're simplifying the onboarding process, and there's an adjacent initiative called Spread Mastodon, which is doing the same thing. Uh, Mozilla is 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 close to. Uh, I think they actually launched the beta now of of their large scale uh mastodon instance so to also you know make it easier for people to sign up um and uh strangely uh meta uh is working on and this had been reported a while ago that meta was working on a twitter like service that would run on top of instagram you could use your instagram login and use this text-based uh system but they apparently are also going to connect it to mastodon which would be awesome i mean because it would open up you know that two major platforms with instagram and and mastodon you know and and now people would be able to interact with each other on the different platforms so um i gotta give meta credit there (laughs) you know um they got out of the metaverse and uh you know doing something that sounds cool at least even though they're about to lay off a bunch of other you know bunch of people again which is not web free is dead uh bitcoin is in the dumpster it's really funny how things have changed but uh i'm actually uh so eurovision was recently and uh i found out uh that there is a group that stages Fedivision, which is um, the Fediverse version of Eurovision. So I'm working on a song to submit for that. Um, and I was up a little late, later than I should have been trying to work on that some more. But uh, it's strange. It, it actually has more guitar parts than keyboard parts. <laughs> <I've> never... <laughs> and I'm not proficient on either instrument, but whatever I'm, I'm i i faked my way through a it's only a three minute song because 
their rules say it has to be no more than four minutes, but Eurovision rules are three minutes. So I'm going with Eurovision rules because I'm. This is my chance to to participate in Eurovision. So mm. that's that's my. Uh, so I'm I'm doing that. That should be fun. Um, and uh, oh, and I'm also trying to submit songs. There's a, a radio station in the Fediverse that I'm trying to get my music on. So yeah, a lot of a lot of cool stuff happening in the Fediverse. Very excited about it. And I, I, I don't have my script. <laughs> so uh, I, was, I was trying to find uh, I was trying to find something about um, the the meteor, the the uh, the fireball. I mean, when you first described it, it sounded like space debris to me. Yeah, well, I thought that, but um, the way that it fell, I was I actually thought maybe Starlink a Starlink launch had gone badly or something. I just didn't see it in the news, and I didn't see anything about that today. I would still believe that it was a Starlink chain that just fell out of orbit or something. But uh, well, everything else has fallen in that part for him. So right. Well, if uh, he doesn't uh, pay his bills, that's what happens. Thanks. Big, big, big disaster with uh, his uh, with the campaign that launched on Twitter today. I, how was it a disaster? I, I heard that it happened. Oh, apparently the link didn't work and. And somehow at one point there may have been like 500,000 people tuned in and then that that Twitter space died. And then there were only like maybe 100,000 that came back. But even so, what's his name? Um, one of the donor guys that are, that are involved in this whole mess. He uh, he made this claim like, oh, this is the most people that have ever been on an online event ever. And it was like it was it maxed out like maybe 600,000 people like more people watch a YouTube live stream than that. I mean, what what is he talking about? I mean, did, and I think it was like a tech bro. I mean, how do these people not understand technology and their tech bros? Their tech knows. Tech knows. Um, tech. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. How's your open source tech life? Is that next? <laughs> I don't really have anything going on in my open source tech life. I, uh, I'm very happy that I work from home and I'm able to use Linux. I, I love my setup here. I was having problems the last time we talked, but the, those have all gone away. I worked out all the issues. And uh, mostly I work in a browser all day. The browser is open source, but basically everything I open is proprietary and most of it is Microsoft, uh, which at one point I think would have upset me uh very much you know i sort of fell out of love with microsoft after uh at, really after the rise of google and the things that they were doing on drive that they were not doing in office and so i just left it for a while and didn't really have a need to use uh microsoft tools because if somebody needed a spreadsheet i would just use google if somebody needed a word document i would just use google and so that's that's just sort of the way that open source is. Whatever somebody expects, you can usually export to that format, and it's not an issue as long as they're able to open and edit it. But uh, aside from the apps that I use on my desktop, things like uh, for screenshots or for uh, uh, viewing videos or GIMP or Inkscape occasionally, for the most part, I'm uh, using Microsoft 365 and for the most part, I'm an evangelist at work for Microsoft 365. I'm, I'm talking people into using things like Teams. So um, I will say that coming back into using Microsoft tools, they definitely have changed. They're, they are much better than they once were. And Teams is, I think, a pretty good system for group communication and for collaboration. Uh, it's, it's funny you mentioned that somebody somebody joked during the whole disaster to, tonight on Twitter Spaces that it's like, oh, in a surprising move, Jeb Bush announces his candidacy on Microsoft Teams. <laughs> strange. Yeah, so I think that for some people, especially people who work from home but are not constantly engaged, it can almost be annoying because it's pinging at you, letting you know that things are going on in the system. And you have to check. But if you're in the system, if you're sitting at your desk and you're working for those eight hours, that you want that. You want to be notified when somebody has a question or somebody wants your attention. And uh, it works great for me. I, I love that 
I can take my workspace in my phone and go out to my car and come back, or I can go to lunch and not worry about missing out on a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but it's so strange to be evangelizing for Microsoft, um, given my history. The difference between working with open source a a applications and Microsoft applications is we have a weekly meeting with a Microsoft team that essentially listens to our needs and our feedback about our users and tries to give us solutions or work out things with our engineers in order to make it right. Um, I'm involved in a couple projects, and the projects would be nearly impossible to run the way that we run them without teams. It, we have a team for that group, and that's where all the files are. That's where all the chats happen. That's where all notifications happen. That's where our project management is. That's where we have uh, email notifications. That's where we have things on our phone of anything having to do with the project that we're working on. We're all kept in touch with it throughout the day. That's also where we have our meetings, right? We're setting up meetings and having them all in the same space. It's not like we're moving out to Zoom or uh, something like that. It's all in one system. It's like, um, what's that super app in China that everybody uses for everything? It's like social media payments, rental payments. Um, I, I think I know what you're talking about. I kind of can't. Yeah, I can't remember it, but it's like a, a, a great example of an ecosystem where everything that you need is in one place. Teams is sort of like that for work. So I, I don't mind it, especially because I don't have to pay the license for it. Everybody at UVA gets it for free. Uh, WeChat? WeChat, yes. Thank you. So what WeChat is for everything in China in your personal life, I guess in your work life, too. Uh, team seems to be available for you to take care of your work needs. And I guess Weibo is another one. Right, I've heard of that too. Weibo, yeah, that's that's the one I. That's actually the first one I thought of, but I couldn't remember. I knew it had a W and a B, but I couldn't remember the rest of it. So I just wanted to shout out uh, UVA. UVA has been a great place to work. I've been there since September of last year, and I will be there at least until December of 2023. But there's a chance that I may be able to have an opportunity to stay there longer. It remains to be seen. But what I will say about it is uh, it's a very comfortable space to work. People appreciate effort. Uh, people are very clear in their communications. And uh, especially comparative to some of the situations we've run in in other institutions. Yes, it sounds completely opposite to the environment we were in when we yeah. first met. <laughs> I feel I feel like I know where I'm at at UVA. You know, considering they hired me to run the website content and then change the website that very day. <laughs> yeah, there's no surprises in as far as culture and environment and. Um, I heard, I think, from you that Rye University apparently ran into a wall with Gmail uh, contract where Gmail essentially locked down every user if they wanted to stay at a free level to uh, be at a half a terabyte of storage, which for many people is impossible, right? Uh, yeah. what's, what's really interesting is that failure of, of communication to users so that they were surprised by the sudden stop by Google was not the case at UVA because there was an entire project dedicated to just notifying people about this coming change, giving them help in order to get their stuff out or lowered to the point where they'd be able to either keep their account or get rid of their account, help to move people from Gmail into Microsoft 365 if they wanted to, where they have five terabytes of space for each user. So it's essentially limitless storage. Um, I wanted to uh, show my appreciation for the project managers at UVA, something that I was only mildly familiar with at the time of Rider University. Uh, it was more like technology managers, uh, but there's a real focus on project management at UVA using like agile method and uh, business analysts that go and uh, hand in hand with those project managers in order to make sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. So it's sort of an executive function and a um, chief of staff function for each of these teams. 
and they just do it so well. I'm so happy about the projects that I'm involved in because the project managers make things happen and there's not a lot of frustration around it. Um, it I also, I'm sorry. No, I'm just, you know, when you talk about that, it, it's just still amazes me like back in whatever, 2001, you know, through 2004 or whatever, when I was the web content coordinator and we worked together, it still amazes me how as late as then, I mean, we had gone through the 90s. I mean, it's not like websites were a, a novel thing by this point. I mean, we were kind of at the early stage of Web 2.0. I mean, it wasn't like it, it just amazes me that they just let us basically run the website. There was no nobody cared about it at all. No Nobody project management, cared no management. about the website. It, it was, cared about the photos on the site. Yeah, it cared, it the yeah. color scheme. And, and, and it just, oh, I, it just boggles my mind still to this day how much they did not give a damn thing about the website. Right. Now, whereas now we actually have a dedicated communications office. Before we send out an email to more than one person, somebody from the communications office needs to see it which is so useful because you don't want to make a faux pas on behalf of your organization. You want an, a second set of eyes. And these eyes are, are seasoned, uh, dedicated editors who just look at it and say, just like, it's just like we AI your paragraph. Uh, they, they are doing that all the time, making sure that it's correct, making sure it's in the, in the right tone, making sure it's not too friendly, making sure it's not angry. Uh, they're emotionally intelligent. They're great. I love working with the communications office. Um, also on Reddit and related to this, uh, there was this post that where somebody was, it was like a job seeking subreddit. And somebody said, I keep seeing consultant everywhere, like technology consultant, for instance. Uh, what exactly does that mean? And it's so funny because I remember when I first became a consultant and had my business sort of transform into a consultancy, I didn't really understand what it was either. And part of the reason for that is it's so, it's such a wide scope definition. You know, it's really an expert who comes in to help with a particular problem. And it might be a broad problem like networking, or it might be a very specific problem like uh, teams. But uh, consultants, they, they can be independent or they can become a part of an organization or they can be somewhere in the middle like a contractor but uh we have consultants on all these teams that are essentially whether or not they're titled that way they're essentially consulting i do consulting every day at uva and it means sitting down with people listening to what the problems are trying to find out what the solution is and reporting back the solution in a kind way uh consultancy work is just fantastic work working from home is a fantastic way to work. It's so nice to be able to uh, wake up gingerly and uh, sit down at my computer, get everything set up the way that I want to have it, have all my everyday tabs open, and uh, just get into the rhythm of work and be able to break and have a cup of coffee and be able to break and take lunch. And it's just such a comfortable way to work. I know that there's a pushback in a lot of companies to bring everybody back on site but um, that's not happening right now at UVA, uh, at least not in the technology department. Most of the work that we do, we, we do remotely. Um, when I do go to grounds, which we shall never call campus, when I do go to grounds, uh, it's usually to have lunch with people. So it's like, it, you know, as compared to having meetings in person where there's all that uh, perspiration associated with um, getting ready for that moment. And if you have a meeting long in the end of the day, it's like you've had it. And that's that doesn't happen as much with work from home. It's like when you get together in person, it's usually a celebratory thing. You know, uh, like recently we had a, a, a couple of the tech managers all made barbecue in like different types. And we came together and had like this amazing feast and people brought cornbread and man, it was great. But uh, we just sat there and joked. We, nobody mentioned a word about work except for one five-minute period where our manager uh, essentially said thank you in a, in a speech. It was really great. 
Uh, speaking of great, uh, as we have said many times, we just have a few minutes left, Brian. Uh, we came together to talk about WordPress. And yes. uh, I will just say that WordPress made my consultancy work. It, it was one of the ways that I made money for years. And I'm very, very grateful for it. I'm, I love how it's changed over the years, its theme management and the way that it's put together, the fact that it's open source, the fact that it's freely available, even online. In other words, it's not only freely available for me to install on my own server, which it is, but it's free for me to go get a WordPress site right now about whatever I want and start to use all of those powerful tools in order to build a portfolio or a CV or explain my business or talk about my favorite topic or whatever it is. It's such a powerful tool and the fact that it's available to anybody is such a um, powerful underlining of how important it's been. Yeah. Um, you know, you back before we launched technology in the arts uh, as a podcast back in 2006, um, you know, when we were trying to figure out you know, where we would have the website, you know, you said, oh, you know, I use WordPress. You got me started on account. And, um, you know, so basically since since then, 2006, I've been a WordPress user. And, you know, so uh, 17 of the 20 years for me and longer for you. Um, I mean, when did when did you start? I mean, was it it was probably like within the first year or two of WordPress's existence, I would think. Right. Yeah, I think I was researching uh Blogging software, Blogger was very popular and, and still yeah. exists. Yeah, yeah, that's where I was. And, yeah. and we knew about Blogger, but the thing about Blogger is it's not open source. And I was so dedicated to open source that I was made aware of it relatively early. It was like, hey, this, this thing really does what it says it's supposed to do. But um, one of the things that was really great about it was everything, so many things were automated for you. All the work that we did in Dreamweaver in order to build the writer site. Yeah. It, that's just taken care of just by creating a new page and giving it a title. All of the visuals are represented well because of the theming system. Plus, I mean, you mentioned podcasts. Podcasts uh, require or required an RSS feed. Right. And uh, the fact that an RSS feed was available not only for the site itself, but also uh, subtopics like uh, tags. You can have an RSS feed for a particular right. tab from a particular site. So if you had a tag called podcast, that was all you needed to do to feed to a uh, podcatcher in order to subscribe. It's it's pretty amazing. And I mean, when Apple changed things with podcasting and really became the place that people find podcasts, uh, it was less important where it was. And there's so many systems that you can use. We're, we're calling this a podcast. Uh, even though we'll probably just freely distribute it as opposed to, I mean, maybe it'll, it, did you put the other one on the RSS feed? I don't remember. Right. So it's like one of those things where, you know, people call YouTube shows podcasts right. and they are in the sense that in, in the ideological sense that you subscribe to something and then you visit it in order to see all of your subscriptions. That's RSS essentially in a, in a nutshell. Um, but it's uh, put in places like YouTube because that's where all my stuff is. And if I pay for premium on YouTube, I don't even have to watch ads, which is how I like it. Uh, but to have that kind of power for the average user and for them not even to necessarily know what power they have. Like I used to do classes at Princeton Adult School just on WordPress. And the thing was that it made me money because somebody would come, they'd learn what they needed to do in order to get started with WordPress. And then they just decided to pay me to make their site for them. So it's, it didn't always work out that way, but it worked out and often enough that that was the point of me teaching there was that uh, I was selling WordPress consulting. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, you know, I, 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 didn't I, have, I didn't have, why am I getting feedback all of a sudden? Um, I, I'm getting feedback on my end. I mean, I'll just back away from the mic, but um yeah, I mean, I, I'm not the, I mean, I was a content person. I wasn't, I didn't really have much experience with backend stuff, whatever. But I mean, WordPress made it so easy, like even I could do it. And so I think what happened was I uh, eventually uh, started, 
Christian Beach's website, my friend Christian Beach, musician. And I, um, I, um, that was a hosted site. That was a hosted WordPress site. So that was kind of like my test ground um, for uh, later on because when I was doing public affairs work for a little firm that you know worked with utilities and and uh, some other you know chemical companies, they were mostly involved in 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 cleanup projects or you know they had sites that needed remediation, um, and so these projects needed a, a website to communicate to the, those communities and, and to, you know, offer updates and, um, you know, just to kind of fulfill outreach requirements. And so I'm like, you know, I can build a site in WordPress for this, you know, and I can make it look somewhat like, you know, the, the, the actual corporate site. And so they gave it a shot and, you know, I built, I don't know, I built like a dozen sites for, for them. Um, so it was, it was, uh, you know, it, it became part of my professional, uh, life too, as well as, you know, the podcasts and, you know, cause my other podcast tandem with the random, which is still on hiatus, uh, for years now. Uh, but that's, that's, that's on WordPress, um, ferocious designs, my music project, Christian beach on, we're on a, a wordpress.com sites now, um, we're on the tier that gets rid of the ads, <laughs> but it's not exactly free, but you know, it's cheap. It's super cheap. It's like, I don't know, $40 a year or something like that. But, um, yeah, uh, I, I wish I've, I, I've done, I wish I could say I've done more long form writing on those platforms recently, but I did back in 2020, write a blog post, uh, about, um, when Christian put out an EP, for the first time, it was his first release since 2009. And of course he puts it out right smack dab in the middle of a pandemic. And then he's like, can you help me make a music video? And I'm like, okay. So we figured out a way to do it remotely. And I thought it was interesting. So I wrote this blog post and the editor of uh, New Jersey stage magazine was like, Hey, you want to adapt that for an article for the magazine? And I'm like, sure. So, I mean, it got me, you know, a little writing, uh, assignment. Um, which was nice, but, um, I've done a couple of year end, uh, music roundups on my tandem with the random podcast blog, um, last year and, uh, at the end of 2021. So yeah, I'm still using it. And, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't know what I'd be without WordPress <laughs> right now. It's, it's, well, thanks to uh, Matt Mullenweg. Uh, he's, he's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it just keeps getting better and, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, their embrace of the Fediverse makes it, you know, yeah. the next well, 20, years, sense, or, even the the next 20 years will be even better. Yeah. I hope so too. If we don't destroy the planet first, not AI, uh, so, it'll be us. Planets, it'll be I'm us gonna, voting I'm for gonna, fascists. Speaking of planets, I'm going to uh, go try to see something. All right. Just All just right. watch out. You don't get hit by a, a meteorite. <laughs> right you can't get head. hit by a meteorite. If once it was going to hit me anywhere, it would hit me right once here. It, so once it hits the ground. Right. Yes. Once it hits the ground after hitting you, then it's a meteorite. All right. I'll remember to tell them that in the ambulance. Yes. Yes. You. Oh, I would. I would. You know I would. I know that you would. I would get mad. I know that you would. It's a. Uh, it's yeah. not a joke at all. It's it's an actual thing that would happen. Yeah, yeah. I would. I'd be not close to death. Rate. I'd be close to death, and I'd be like, "It's a meteor." Meteor. Like, if it's on the ground, it's a meteor, right? Well, I'm glad that you're doing better, Brian. I really am. Um, uh, this world is better with you in it, and I really appreciated having this conversation with you. <laughs> I don't know about that, but yeah, I guess. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go see if I can catch some uh, starlings falling out of the sky. Okay, so it, it'll be something. Maybe maybe that car will, will come back down to Earth. That's possible. Yeah, that, it really should. I mean, that's, it doesn't belong up in space. No, no. No, it belongs in a one-lane tunnel going very slowly. No, going way faster than it should. Well, you saw what – what was What's the name of that company? Boring, boring, boring company, boring but company. yeah, 
But uh, where was it that uh, some some city? I think in Florida. Uh, I thought it was like in New York. No, no, no. But some city in Florida like signed a contract for the boring company to create uh, a, you know one of their one lane you know Tesla tunnels to the beach, and it's like. The ground is so underwater there. It's like it's it's going to cause everything to collapse. <laughs> it's, it's 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 such a disaster, and, and like they they lowballed the estimate. It, it's whatever. It, uh, well, if they're going to make a million of them, they're going to have to keep them cheap. Florida and Musk, man, that's just the bad combination. Florida As proven tonight, true. earlier tonight with uh, ugh, that fascist. Mm. All right, brother. I'm gonna let you go. <laughs> All right. So on that note, I guess we're wrapping that up, wrapping this up, John. <laughs> All right. So for mm. technology and the arts, this is Brian Kelly. This is John Lamazzi. Take care. Take care.